Hello class. Uh, in this video I'm going to do something a little different than I have done in the past and I'm going to uh, show you this drawing here that I have up on my screen and really how I sort of came to it as a complete drawing. Typically most of my videos, which I think at this point are well over a hundred, are short videos uh, mainly that focus on how to do one specific thing that can teach you a lesson that you can then apply to your own drawing. Of course the one downside of that method um, is that it doesn't really show how to compose a complete drawing, how to think of all those things in unison, um, although it is a great way to sort of set up a learning and application to your own drawing, and who wants to watch a long video when you just need one minute of information to keep you moving, so that's what those videos are for. Uh, so, but, but you know, I made this drawing recently, or I should say I am making it, and I figured I'd take some time to show not every single thing that would take far too long. Um, but basically, all the little tri ticks and, uh, tricks that I used when composing this, what they are, even though I might, you might not exactly see every single step along the way, just, just a series of steps of how to get there. Um, I'm probably still tweaking this. I wanted to get this video done, though. I'm on midwinter break, as we call it here on campus. It's going to end soon. Um, we're having a big monster snowstorm starting to roll through, and so my son's getting off of school. So I wanted to get this video out uh, before the break ended and before he is done with school. So I'll probably still tweak this, but I figured, you know, it's definitely far enough along that we can get a video going for it. Uh, so this is what the final drawing looks like right here, and I'll, again, I'll show every every sort of piece, I'll show this, the, the tricks that I use to get it to look the way it is. Um, I'll, I'll actually show that on this drawing. This is the exact same drawing, except for I turned off all the effects in the appearance uh, toolbar, and I'll go sort of step one by one, turn them on, and show you what they are. Uh, so these are all the basic shapes, um, and the colors. Of course, colors can take a long time to work out in the end and, and sort of it's one of the things I'm still working on um, and I often recommend you almost have to get a lot done before you can even start to address the colors and how and how they match uh, but I do sort of broadly speaking um, especially when we sort of go over to the finalize because what we're not seeing even on on the other one um, on this one we see so a slightly different partially because there are effects on top of effects that change the color of the final output um, uh, so if I went over here, they're they're close on the that other one. But if I go over here, you know the the lighting of this is sort of the sunset ish setting, this yellow sky, this orange sky, pink skies, colors, and and don't be fooled. Or I sort of mentioned this in other videos, but even the blues in this drawing are really greens, and the greens in this drawing are really yellows or towards those colors. Anyway, they're ex highly exaggerated. And I might show some examples. When we, when we get into it. And the reason for that really is because of the sky, the lighting. It sort of, our eye interprets the yellow lighting as affecting all the colors. And so, um, so this drawing sort of takes that account. And, it, and it's really just sort of practice and play, you know, and, and give things a go and see what happens. And, and you have to have it all sort of on there to get it to work. Um, so that, that takes time too. Of course, when I jump ahead to this level, we don't, we're not going to see any of that work today. You're not going to get to see original colors or anything like that. The colors are already have been decided, um, as well as all the settings for the various effects. You know, I played with various things, tried things, took things off, reset things, so on and so forth. You sort of get, get the final output of where it is today. But it's still sort of interesting to see these sort of basic shapes of how I sort of create my work that, you know, I don't draw trees as fully trees and, and things. I let Illustrator do a lot of that for me to make it quick and make it applicable in many other drawings, which is really great professionally as you're trying to work. So I should get into this. Um, what I'm going to do is I'll just, uh, I'll, uh, I'm going to turn most everything off here to start to show you sort of where I started. I was, the, the beginning here will be the process of exactly how I started, um, although uh, at certain points I'll break down because I went back and forth. I did a little work in the building, did a little work in the background, building, foreground, so on and so forth, back and forth. In this case, other than the start here, it'll sort of just move through in a rational way, potentially by how I set up the layers. Um, so, but but the, the way I did start is I started with a blank piece of paper. Obviously, I picked eight and a half by eleven landscape. I just didn't even give it much thought. It just was so basic. I, that's what I did. 
but I quickly did give give some things some thought. So the first thing I did is I added this sort of brownish color to sort of make it feel more like paper, so a, an off-white. And what I did is I drew that for the whole page, and I gave myself a, a decent border around all edges, about three quarters of an inch, and I drew another square in there, and then I, I used clipping mask or compound path, I should say, to cut the hole in here so we see the white below. Of course, in the end, this white won't exist, but really I was just focused on this border here. And I gave this whole thing a um, gray line. If I unlock it here and select it, we can see it's actually a gray line. And if I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a lot of appearance. Let me pull this appearances out so we'll be able to see this, see this for all the drawings. Um, this one's pretty simple, but if I see the stroke. I just applied a film grain. What that did is it just um, it just sort of gives it this almost like pencil texture. Just very simple. Just a little bit of texture so it doesn't look so harsh to the eye like often a computer black line might look. Um, and of note, not that, you know, to solve one of these problems, of course, I have this sort of fake layer on here to block out so I don't see beyond the paper because a lot of times what you have to do is you have to pull the object outside because this outside edge also has that same line. And so it's just easy, just, oh, we'll make it bigger than the paper, then I'll often create this layer. I call it the blackout layer, but it's exactly just the color of this background right up to the edges. So anything that needs to extend off, oftentimes it's borders like this or trees or even sky or whatever the case might be. Be, you pull it off the page, and but I want to see what the final composition looks like. It's quick and easy to do um, that. So I, so I set that up. So once I had sort of my main artboard set up the way I wanted it to, what I, what I did is I, I hid them here. So let me show my guides. I set up uh, guides on the page because uh, the next step was I wanted to place the building on here and I used the rules of thirds so I broke up the visual white field into three places horizontally and three vertically. We'll see this extra line here I'll show in a second. It's actually an approximate horizon line that I used for the image which was set up which I pulled in after I pulled in the building which I haven't done yet. But w what I ended up doing was you guys have seen the other videos this house is the same thing I use in many of them. I drew it in CAD, I modeled it in SketchUp, I've rendered it in any hundreds of ways that you can see on the videos. Uh, but what I did for this video is something a little different that I, I sort of like exploring which is I brought in lines, vector lines from SketchUp of perspective and it sort of reminds me, you know, back back in the olden days when, when 3D modeling was just sort of coming out and 3D rendering, it took forever to do even a low quality 3D rendering. And what, So what we'd often do to be quick is we'd, we'd model it, we'd wireframe it, print it out, and then hand render on top of that. So it sort of saved the time of all the constructing of the perspective, but we just wasn't time to do a sort of photo reel rendering or anything else. Um, of course, times have changed since then, and all my videos are purely, you know, the common thing practice in architecture is you, you do it, you model it wherever, you use whatever rendering engine you want to, and then you post process it in Photoshop. You know, for a long time that was photo reel rendering. Now we're sort of moving beyond to the non photo reel rendering and using Photoshop and and sort of, I was sort of thinking like that the the old style sort of helped the perspective, uh, but you, but your hand rendering on top sort of made it uniquely your, your own, which is something I've talked a lot in the computer. So f Illustrator, which I'm in, has so much control over drawing. Why not sort of take that process? This is not a process that should be applied all the time. It definitely takes longer than letting the computer. Uh, render engine for you but like why not take some time over break I have this break now and see what I can do and just take the vector work almost exactly like I did before but instead of hand rendering on top of it I'll use Illustrator to create the kind of drawing I want to do so that said that was a long sentence but I think it produces interesting results um, what I did is I opened SketchUp that model that I already had I took a perspective that I thought expressed the architecture well at eye level like I used usually do. That's what I like. And I just exported. I went to the export to uh, 2D graphic as a DWG, which of course is an AutoCAD file. Of course, Illustrator can open AutoCAD files, so I literally just open that AutoCAD file um, in a new file, in a new tab. I don't have it open here. And I copied it and pasted it into this file. And so, so if I go down here, that's right here. And then I just scaled it 
into place. And what I was doing, the reason the reason why I have the guidelines on, because I purposely tried to get uh, sort of this in, this corner right here at one third point, and uh, you know at that point I then basically centered it on the drawing from sort of left to right. So I was using these thirds, and then this top third, I, I'm keeping most of the building in the bottom two thirds. So I set. You know, you don't have to be perfectly accurate with this thing, but I, I set this here, and then I, I purposely sort of set, I thought might look good as this, there's almost this horizontal line running across these elements of the roof and overhangs. So I set that at the second, third point there. That's actually this one, I think, a couple of minutes ago, I said this is the horizon. This is actually, I think, the third point. And then once I had this scaled and put this these lines right where I wanted them to, I, um, then struck what were approximately the horizon line of this is for the image so I could work with this as needed in the background element. So that's what this line is. Now, what I, I did not do this at this point in time, but at, um, I eventually, at some point in time, I took these elements and um, let's see, I added rough into them yeah, right here in the appearances, you, you can see this. And so if I turn this on, it might take a second to render here. It's very subtle. I might have to zoom in to show. We can see what it does. It just makes the line squiggly. When you zoom in, they're almost overly squiggly, and I'm, and maybe I'm overcompensating because it's a computer. Because when you take this off, you have these perfectly rigid, straight lines that only a computer can do, and it almost becomes overly boring. And so, uh, if you put a rough, you can use rough in and just sort of make them a little squiggly, a little bit. And so when you zoom out, they just become close to perfect but not quite and just adds that little bit of interest again I did that much later in the process but uh, but for the sake of this video I'm just showing that's how I did it there let me pull this guy out a little bit um, so we can see some layers so I did that and then you know again I worked all over the place but if I were to sort of continue what I, what I did um, do let's see I had also brought in from SketchUp just as base bases I didn't use them precisely but I brought in two other images. I exported an image of just shadows like this. So that way when I had to make my shadows and shading, I could just take a look at it. I could have gone back to SketchUp and looked at it, but I just looked at it here and I said, okay, that's approximately the shape. And then I drew it. Um, I could have done it without that. I mean, I know I generally know enough about shadows to have come close without doing it, but it certainly made my life easier. Um, so I, I brought that layer in and um, let's see. Actually, that that those are the shadows I drew, I think, because these are the layer. That's this is the s shadow layer from SketchUp right there. That's the shadow layer from SketchUp. So you can see I sort of emulated it closely because I could just look. I could just on and off this layer and say, okay, where does it go in this point in time? And when I drew it, and I'll talk about that when I show shadows. And I did the same thing. Let's see. Oops, what did I do to this layer here? I did something to this layer. Um, anyway, it doesn't. Does this doesn't much matter? Yeah, I'm not sure what I did here, but anyway, maybe I just took in an image of a, a rendering from SketchUp, and that was only there so I could draw the material, so I could see the siding and the brick and all the work, and I could see the lines. I didn't use it precisely; I just did it again so I could reference it as I do. I'll show you ex how I did those materials though in Illustrator, because that's that's really the important thing. So the fact that we don't see that I might have deleted or something along the way when I was creating, and I no longer needed it. I don't remember every last detail, so it wasn't important. I just used guides. I'm like, hey, if I got resources just look at them you know make my life easier that's all so so anyway let me go down here to this I'll just look at the building and I'm going to turn on um, the material here let's see building color here we go I could look at the lines of the materials first we're going to go I'm going to go to building color um, sorry I know I'm sure there's a lot of layers I should probably pull these layers off to make it easier too in fact why don't I do that just you know, pull this down. You can see it's almost like most of my Illustrator files don't have layers like this. This looks very much like a Photoshop layer structure, uh, which is interesting because I'm doing work that I typically do in Photoshop, but I think more successfully here with more control. So anyway, here's here's just a base color for my siding, and I just want to show you this here. You can see, look at look at this color, this this color where it exists in the hue range. It's very saturated, of course. It's very much towards uh, the green. 
green end or to the gray end, and it looks very gray on my screen right here. But here it is with the rest of the drawing. You can see it takes on much more of a bluish hue, and again, I think a lot of that is becomes of this bright yellow spot happening behind there. So that's what I want to talk about colors. You just pay attention to those sorts of things. So here's the base color. I have a base layer uh, that's just set with pretty much nothing else on there. And then I have this color again and I just used a grain texture. I think it's clumpy or something like that with an opacity of 25 to add a little bit of detail to it. And then I this is going to take a few minutes to render here. Then I use this sort of watercolor technique that I have in other videos that's based off a stained glass window and paint jobs and sometimes uh, cut out in, in between there. And that sort of gives it an uneven sort of set of colors uh, across the way. And, um, and then I actually have a black fill, believe it or not, with an inner glow of white. What, you set it to screen. On screen, black disappears. And so I just sort of lighten up, whiten up the edges. What I found was interesting about that, because I didn't create it in this order at all, I had this layer on early. And what I found is it almost looked overly computer rendered. Because what it did is when I have it, I don't have the shadows on yet. But when I, had, when I turned on the shadows, it gave this subtlety of shadow shift that you often see from a uh, rendering engine from a computer. Um, and so that's why I added some, like this edge sort of breaks that down, which is why I like that. So it's complementing in the end the um, inner glow that I have on this layer. Now you can also see that um, I didn't even care. I, I'll fill in all the rest of the details over top. So I simplified it just as big sort of shapes like that. Um, and this one, I also have to turn on all of those things here as well, because there's something else going on in this. Um, layer that I should mention, um, which is there's also layer control set. So if I come over here and click the dot to get the entire layer, we see that I also have uh, a fill of a gradient set over top of it. So it shifts the color from um, darker to, to really I have the darker end set on this end to brighter on this side, which complements the setting. But again, starts to take this so it's not consistent across the uh, entire drawing. Um, so there's subtle variations at different levels. And really, most of the, the since this this siding um, is the most of the building, this is where I spent the most time. Um, I spent some time on the brick, as I'll show, in some other places. But, but you'll see not everything required as much detail because they're smaller and in their eyes being attracted to this, to these areas of the drawing so I could if I focused on those a little bit more than others, it it, it would get the desired look that I, that I want to do. And of course, the one thing we're still missing from here is line work to describe this as siding. So uh, that was done on a different layer, um, which I can show here. So I'll lock that layer and um, uh, let's see, we'll go up to materials and this is vertical siding. I'll show that here. Oh, i got to turn on this layer also to see. So there we go. This is, I've got the lines there to then to create the siding. And the way I did this um, is I didn't draw each line. Um, what I did is I drew a straight line down at the corner. I blocked some of it off so we don't, we don't see it incomplete. And I drew like this line here at the edge. Right? And then what I did is I said, okay, how many pieces of siding do I need? And what I did is I I ended up looking at my original AutoCAD drawing. I said, okay, I need, whatever. I don't remember the number in this case, but 15. I could count that easily or even, you know, in, in AutoCAD or the SketchUp model or whatever you're doing. And I used Blend. I double clicked here and I said, it says smooth color. I went to specific steps and I typed in like 15 or whatever the number was you want. And then you click that line, you click, click this line over here and it, fill, it blends in the exact number of steps you need in the perspective. So because this edge is lower than this edge up here, it'll make that edge come right down to the edge of the perspective. And the same will happen across here. What I then did is I just uh, cut this out. I uh, I made a clipping mask for, for that to cut out the area here where I didn't need the siding in this case, and so on and so forth over here. And uh, over here, you can see I didn't even cut it out because I knew that later on it would just be filled in with other colors. So you can literally see the original line work. And then once I had those straight lines, what I did is I did exactly what I did to the edge, which is I added roughen to these guys. You can see to match the same roughen from my original SketchUp model to make it a little bit 
bit hand drawn look there and you can see I use the same color gray and everything else as the previous thing to keep to keep the, the line work in lines again I actually did this work after adding all the color on but you can do it in whatever order you choose to do so if we if we continue to look through the building um, you know the next thing I did was I sort of added this uh, second color on here and um, you can see it only exists here there's no effects on this color it's too dark to get any significant look out of the effects and it's too small of an area because even this window area is ultimately going to be blocked over so I said hey you know it doesn't need anything add some blue well let's let's take a look at this color really quick just to see what the hue is this one is definitely more closer to, to blue it's a darker color there but even so it's still slightly shifted towards green. Then maybe I, I looked at the brick. In this case I used a sort of a brown color. Uh, and this does have a, a few different settings on here that I've turned off. And so I, I started with the idea of stained glass, much like uh, I do watercolor effect. And that's to get the size texture of brick. Again, the line work is done in a different layer. This is just to get the textural quality of it. And then I sort of use sponge, which is a, a little different method than I than I use. And so you get this dark spots and these light spots. And it looks sort of strange here, but I, but I um, again, I actually did this after adding the line work uh, for the bricks. And I thought it ended up working out pretty well. I think it could be used for masonry, stone, and other things like that. So let me take a, a minute and step back up to these layers. We can see if I turn on the horizontal lines, I did those horizontal lines just like these verticals. I use blend. I drew a line down here. And in fact, you can even do the corner too. Like I drew the corner to this corner and then to here. And it's pretty flat, but this is these are this is not a straight line across here. And then I did sort of the same up here. I drew this. I drew one line. It went to here. Had a point. Went to here. And then I blended the number of steps in between, and it set all the horizontals lines. The same with with this. And I did the exact same thing for the brick as well, uh, but I had to do it in a few steps. I have a horizontal, um, right? So I've got I've got the horizontal did the exact same thing, except for I had, the number of steps had to be a lot more, right? And then I had to estimate it. I think I said a hundred, and I tried it, and it looked like oh, that's close enough. Um, uh, something like that. And we can see I did did it on back back here too. Um, and then I had to do the vertical for the brick, which took a little bit more time um, because I, I use the same process, but the issue is it's not a straight line. It's sort of broken up. Um, and so I could draw one line here. I, I, I had to do it a few times to get the steps just exactly right. But I drew like one little line there and one little line down at the bottom. And then I blended them vertically. So if I used 100, I basically had to use half because it's every other brick. And then I did the same for this side, and then I blended them horizontally, whatever the number was, I don't remember, 15 or something. And it set that set one row of the vertical lines. And then I had to do it again because this row is offset. So I had to do the same exact thing. So it took a couple blends. But really, once I got used to it, it was just setting a couple lines up and then blending them together, and it made this sort of quick uh, brick pattern. I mean, yeah, um, and, the, and the issue for that is because it's in, in perspective. And so if you made a brick fill, that's not going to be in perspective. Um, so it's a few more steps. So it really wasn't too bad. You can see I applied it there. You'll notice this is so far back. I didn't even worry about applying the verticals to it. It took a lot of time. Like, yeah, you know what? No one's going to see it. it. The horizontals is fine. Back in the olden days again, when I was taught to render brick, and I, and I was taught in Philadelphia, I went to school undergraduate in Philadelphia, where like everything is brick. So rendering brick was important. Um, we, were, the, we were taught, you do the horizontal lines partially because they're easy and partially because our eye sees them because they're on alignment. And then you do texture to, to represent the rest. So I haven't turned that texture on. I had to, I'd have to go back to the brick layer here because uh, I turned that off. It's exactly the same as the other brick. I just need a second to uh, to turn this fill on. And, yep, there we go. I think that is everything on. So we can see the settings are slightly different. We can see it's a little more 
more faded, I think, than over here because of the distance. I just changed the fade a little bit. But you can see when I zoom out, the fact that the horizontals aren't on this one don't much matter because of, because of the being into the distance of the background. So those little tricks are important. I think sometimes people, when they get to draw on computers, is like everything needs to be perfect because in Illustrator or AutoCAD or SketchUp or whatever, you can zoom in so far, you can make everything perfect. And you really can save a lot of time if you just start, say, looking at the drawing at the level you're going to look at the drawing at. So even here, sometimes I'll just look, okay. Well, on your on the YouTube screen, of course, it won't. But on my screen, this 4 to 5 looks like about an inch. So that's the size of the drawing. And to me, this looks like brick. With You know, I didn't have to do it all. Um, and I ha But I had to do a little bit more here where it's bigger and more more pronounced. So... You can save time by doing that. I see a lot of, seen a lot of interns waste a lot of the co a company's time by doing work that was never seen in the end. But anyway, enough, enough about that. Uh, sounding, sounding a bit old there. Uh, let's see. Going back to to color. I mean, I, you know, I added um, this gray on for the roof. And if I unlock this and looked at the appearances. Um, there's actually, I did, I did a, this fancy gradient on here to sort of make reflections. It's actually the same one I used for Windows. I literally, if you find the video on how to do a double gradient on Windows, it's literally, it's the same thing except for there didn't need to be a double gradient. It just needed to be what is technically that second one. We'll see this on, on the Windows. Uh, and it looks like this. It's a bunch of white together and then some are transparent and some are not. And they're all set up like that. So, so it makes it looks like, look, look like, look, look like a reflection there so I had there and then oh the uh, the lines for that were, were interesting and fun I had fun with this actually I have had this first time I'd done I'd never done this before so live in this video I, I drew the lines just like I drew all these other lines I drew that line and I drew the line out here of course it's clipped out now so we don't see it but it came up to about here and then I uh, blended them across the number of steps to get the all these horizontal lines lines of this uh, standing seam metal roof. But what I ended up doing then is I gave the the lower end, the end of the line, I gave it a little dot under the stroke. Let's see if we can, actually we're going to have to go in here to to see this. Let's cut the, double click a couple times uh, to see the stroke. Let's see, where where did I give that line? It's, there we go. We can see I gave it these little dots just to give it almost like, again, zoomed in, it looks like silly a little dot, but from zoomed out, it looks like what might be the edge of that standing seam because we're going to see a little bit of that verticality of it. So I thought that was clever. I like to work that way. And then I gave it a drop shadow, this white drop shadow color to make it, again, look like a highlighted in a shaded area as well to... Um, to make it look like it's standing. And it's, it's a subtle technique that when you zoom out just adds that little bit of detail that looks looks pretty good in the end. So those little tricks like that um, really help like thinking outside the box. So I did that roof there. Uh, let's see. Um, that was all the pretty much line work. And then we get to you know covering up all the stuff we didn't need. So I saved time by knowing that my trim and my glass and all this stuff would be above the layer. right? So I, I always add trim right over the windows. Again, this trim is meant to look white. Clearly, right now, it does not look white against the white background. Eventually, this white's going to be completely gone. And because of the colors used on the screen, this looks white. Again, it's purposely not white because it's meant to be this white reflects the color of the lighting and the things around it. So it would, it, if I made this white, it would look exceptionally bright in this drawing. So it's just sort of this tan, beigey color there. Uh, there was nothing I, I applied to that. It was just the color. Then, then we went to I have this glass layer, and the glass um, is a gradient. Uh, I made sure the gradient, it's sort of the same color, it starts with the same colors as what the sky was, so I did the final colorization after I did the sky, uh, but I made them much darker. Um, and it, But it's just a simple uh, gradient here, why well, I uh, select it, it's just a simple gradient from a dark yellow to a dark orange. The the orange is slight, not quite as dark as this yellow, so it sort of lightens up across the top. Uh, and uh, have this sort of deep background. And then what I did was, um, this is a trick you can find in another video. Again, to note, I made sure that the gradient of all these windows 
was the same. So it was dark on the bottom and light at the top. You just select it all. You do your gradient across the top. And then I want to add the second gradient to the layer level. So you click that dot. You can add a fill. You can see a complete video. And I used another gradient, which is exactly like the one we saw for the roof. It was a bunch of white with some transparent and some not. And then I just angled it to sort of get reflections across the building like that. Sort of really, that really starts to pop the idea that this is glass. It's, it's useful. You can make the argument and, and, and I sort of went through this thinking process. You can make the argument that in these laying conditions, that's not the right reflections. That works great during the day, but this is sort of an evening or morning scene. Uh, but they're also like, well, maybe they're like curtains. By the time you add everything else, like maybe they're curtains or something else happening behind the window, which you would see in this case. And really, it's just about adding a level of detail. This is a pure flatness. Just doesn't doesn't quite provide enough interest so it becomes ambiguous enough in the end that it still works by, by adding that level of detail you need to do. Uh, then I did sort of the wood trimmed areas. I did a really uh, uh, interesting thing, I, I thought an interesting thing on here um, that I, again I don't actually think I have a quite video for although I've done somewhat similar things before because obviously I added a brown color that's that's obvious. Um, but what I did is I had it twice on here, the same brown color, but I, I what I did to the second one is I made a scribble. And so I set the scribble angle to be in the angle sort of of the plane of the roof. Um, and I didn't even care. I mean, technically, I might have should have done a separate image for the trusses or it's not trusses, but the uh, rafters here. But uh, but I didn't. I just did it all like that, and I added a scribble, and I multiplied it, which makes it darker against the original brown, and so it sort of starts to give it implying of this wood grain texture, uh, quick and easy. But I think it really just has that that exact subtle quality that you need out of it. So if I turn it on for all the places I have wood, I think there's is there one down here? I think I still have it on. Yeah. Okay. So that did that, add that little bit of texture, and then conc I call it concrete, it's a foundation, I guess, peeking up, I just said the stairs were the same thing, and um, uh, I didn't even add, that's just color, that's just pure color, so um, I could, okay, could I have added texture there? I could have, I just like, you know what, it's so small, it doesn't matter, any texture's not going to much matter for that, so that, that's pretty much the building in terms of materials and the line work. And then of course I had to add shadow. So I already talked about that. This is pretty simple. All it is is a black layer which I made transparent and I drew it using the pen tool in the shape that the shadow should be and I sort of used my SketchUp. I looked at SketchUp as like, okay that's the shape it takes and, and sort of I drew it out as needed. I set the transparency uh, sort of to a level I want. Sometimes I play with color in my shadow. In this case I did not. That might be something to look for that I want to look, move forward and, and look at. I just haven't gotten there. Um, so that's what that is. And then, then what I did is I added another layer here called shade, which is basically also a black layer, very transparent. So it's barely visible. So I'll click this off again. You can see it's on this side of the building. I, the, the light is coming from this side of the building. So I wanted to keep that bright, but just to sort of enhance the corners. So for example, like the difference between this edge and this edge, which is at a corner, and this edge and this edge, which is at a corner, to enhance that a little bit, I added this shade layer. Just I traced over those planes, made it black, added a slight transparency to them, and again, just enhances the three-dimensional quality of that image. I didn't even care if it went over windows or other shadows or anything like that. Oh, that's the one thing I should mention about the shadow layer, um, is oftentimes I'll apply the appearance at the layer level, not at the object layer level, sorry. That means if, if I mess up a shadow, I can overlap shadows, and they will still look right. Again, check out my things on shadows that shows all the details about that. But again, using just like the glass, which uses layer level control, using layer level control on shadows is equally as helpful. Um, I think it's a trick that people don't often know about Illustrator that you can do that at the layer level. Um, so there we go. So that's that's basically the building complete. Um, you know, all the, all the things for the building. So I can move on to the various background uh, elements and, you know, and no particular order except for starting at the bottom seems to make sense. So here's the sky. The sky starts with a basic gradient, um, 
but there was definitely a lot of work that went into it. So besides the basic gradient, I just started with what is a version of what I call my watercolor effect. Again, you can see all the details. Um, let me go slower. This is taking too long to render and it's skipping. Yeah, I shouldn't, shouldn't have done that. My screen just went black. I'm going to assume, assume yours did too. Um, but you can go to my other videos and see um, what this effect looks like in all the steps and you know the settings in the for each one of these uh, steps. But I but I like to start with the stained glass because it breaks up the thing into to large size planes because I find illustrator textures are often too small. So this is one that I can sort of get big fields of change in. And so once I do that, the problem is it's got these black lines. So so I find running paint daubs is a good intermediary in that. Now sometimes I'll run cutout in between. Um, I didn't find that was necessary for this one, but I, I did try it. Uh, so we can see now I've got sort of these big sort of blobby shades of areas. Uh, but then it's like, okay, well, it's almost too stark of a difference, too hard line of an edge still between them. So, so I'll run some ocean ripples on that to sort of blend this drawing together, which just starts to be good. But then I get some of these like reflection areas in here, which might be difficult to see on YouTube. So then I'll just use a little bit of a Gaussian blur and then I'll blur that away. Um, and I didn't in this case blur that entirely away because I thought that level of, of texture was interesting, but I did wanted to soften it a little bit so we can see it softened a little bit. So that's the basis of that background, but I still wanted more variation in this. So I think that's a pretty good step right there. But then what I did is I added a fill right on top of this. It's the same exact object. I just added the fill right in the appearance box. I added this sort of yellow to orange to transparent uh, gradient fill across it. We'll see. Um, this palette knife is a killer on my, this, I'm not, I'm, you know, this isn't the fastest computer in the world here, so this palette knife tends to slow, slow this down. Fortunately, once we're through this le level, uh, we'll see that. You can see this was the final output then of that sky, but even this layer has several things on it that I, I just want to turn off. I know it's going to take forever. We're already well into this video. It's going to be a movie. Imagine if you actually had to watch me draw all these elements, how long it would take. You know, I, I have a, I'm going to take a shortcut here. If I turn this off, this fill off temporarily, it will not have to render every time I show this upper fill. Let's give this a second to work its way through. La 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 la. No, you don't want to hear me sing. Okay, so here we go. I'm just going to turn these things off. Oh, it is still going, even though I'm not showing it. Boo. I thought it would not have to go. Um, well, this will be... So we can see what I did. I added scribble first. A thick line, very swiggly, just like this, to get really just quick strokes across it all. I then tweaked it. Use the tweak command that sort of took these straight uh, lines and sort of put them a bit all over the place, slightly, just to make, what I'm trying to do is make big blobs on this thing um, that will blend into the back background, just add a level, a, a higher level of texture to it. So there we go. So it sort of made this sort of blobby shapes, right? Pretty nice. And then I just feathered it out because the, I thought the edge lines were a bit hard on here. I don't mind that it's coming below the horizon line and all the stuff here. That'll be covered over with other objects in a few steps from now. So we're getting close. Getting close. So there we go. So that was the sort of, you can see this top fill. That's all we're looking at here. I, I added an opacity to it. Um, and I might have um, yeah, just normal, just an opacity, just to give these sort of blobbiness to it that is overlaid on top of the gradient that we looked at previously. So this will be turning it on. Hopefully this is the last time we have to render this whole palette knife thing. Um, and we will see the final sky here, which I thought, even when I did this, I sort of found it to be a bit bright, 
with nothing else on. Like right there, it seems a bit bright, but it sort of softened as I added the rest of the background and foreground to it. So close that. Um, I did this horizontal, what I call the horizontal block, which really ended up being mountains because I just wanted to stop the sky from coming down and whatnot. And all I did was I added a uh, rough into it to sort of get the sort of like mountain peaks to to it. That's all. It was, just, it was a rectangle, and I just said, oh, let me rough in it. Sort of became interesting. And then the, the, there's a theme in a lot of the background elements of, of this sort of horizontal texture, which is just grain set to horizontal. And when you go to your Photoshop effects, you can see this. I have other videos on specifics, but you can actually change the way. Instead of being dots, you can do lines, horizontal, or vertical. And so that's what I used there. Pretty simple. I did a little bit of opacity to get some of the texture from behind it, but nothing much there. And then again, I have a, a what I call the grass plane, which is the start of, of the sort of transition from foreground to background. I have some vertical grain in it, and I added a fill. I'll show you what this fill does here. What this fill does is it starts to whiten out the interior and has the vertical of grain effect more on the, the outside edges of that. Again, it, um, it's white, uh, but I feathered it with black, or I should say I inner glowed is going to be black. See, there's black there. Uh, and then I added a little bit of grain to that to give it a further texture. But when I set it to screen, the black fades away. So what happens, I see the full level of this fill below with its grain. And then where there's white, it sort of whitens it out, just softens it up in the middle of the screen and sort of brings your eye there into the middle of the screen. And then I have this whole set of tree layers here. I want to start with this pine tree because I thought this was the most fun. This is literally the sh original shape of this pine tree uh, is right here. Uh, it's just a triangle with a gradient across it with a line, with a dark line. And you can see, actually, I can show... Um, let me take a step back just for one second. We'll look at this again. I want to show some of these colors here, these grass colors. Look at how far toward, look at how yellow or orangey this color is. It begins to read as greens. And I did, when I do the foreground, I have some more green greens in there to help along as well. But they're really pushed towards this yellow color because of the lighting implied by the sky. So sorry about that. The same is true for the trees. That's why I wanted to mention it for the trees because these, these colors, it's a gradient, so it's harder to show you the exact color without doing work. But, uh, but it's the same exact concept. You can see that this color here in bright is really not that dissimilar from that color color there. So it's a gradient, but you can see in the appearances how much there really is going on here. So I start with a stroke, and actually in this case, the stroke is pulled all the way to the back, the bottom, because you can do this. I don't usually do this, but I drag the stroke down below the fill, and that becomes important in a later step. For now, it doesn't really matter. Um, except you can see I've made it also dash just to give it a, the, itself a little bit of texture. So it's added a dash to that stroke. And then I've just got to fill. It's a standard gradient. It's the base level of this tree. There's nothing special. It's just a two-color gradient. Okay. But then I start doing some other things on top of that. So then I add the same vertical technique that I've been applied to most everything that we have here to sort of bring it in line with it. That's That's not too special. That's fine. Um, and then I added sort of an inner glow to, to give the edges uh, a, a darker glow, which ultimately when this finalized shape happens, it gives sort of shadowing to the branches of the tree. That's why that is there. So if I turn on all the fills, oh, there's one more fill, which is just a scribble fill, which again is just adding a little bit of detail. I felt like this tree was sort of right here in the foreground. It was setting the center of this drawing. I wanted to give it a little more detail. I'm still not sure that I have finalized the, this fill or if I even want it on here. It's one of the things I'm working with, but that's the idea behind that. So once I have all the fills and strokes on, that's what the shape is. And the rest of the work for this tree, uh, just to let you know, this is what that tree looks like. This one right here. It's this triangle. It is a triangle. It all is done on these effects. Illustrator effects, and so like many trees, and you you can watch some details in other videos um, that I have of how to do trees. I got a lot on trees. Is it's it uses the concept of using roughen twice at least. So the first roughen is big. It sort of gives the overall uh, shape of the branches. So we can see that like it's coming way out, then it comes way in, right? And then the second roughen gives the shape of the edges of that. So it goes in and out along that shape. Not going to get into the geometry of the reason why, it just tends to work. 
Um, now, what I what I added in here then for this tree is I added this warp of an arc to sort of pull it up because it sort of make it feel like the branches are sort of rising up, which is the uh, branches uh, on evergreens sort of have this arc type look to them. So I tried giving this warp of an arc. It helps a little bit. Quite honestly, I wish it would have done more, but I, you know, I, rather than having to draw each bow separately, I was like, this is definitely good enough. It was a lot quicker to do. And then I added tweak to it which you can see really tweaks up the edges a lot. It starts to give this a, uh, a really organic feel uh, based on, on all that stuff. And then I still, I wasn't quite happy with the shape, even this triangle here. And so I used free distort, which allows you to pull the corners in tighter in certain areas. And so I was really able to tighten up that top line to really pinch it to the top like a pine tree would do. And there we go. So this is it, this is a triangle. You can see it here with this blue line. It was just the addition of all these effects up top that turned it into this shape. And of course the texture of the interior fill is all of this stuff in here. And, and there we go. That was the first tree. The other trees were much more simple in the background, although they use similar effects. So um, I have these trees here. Oops, uh, unlock the right layer. These are the shapes of the trees are this sort of, I don't know, polygonal shape. Quickly just drew, draw, draw, drew where I wanted the tree to be. And then I did basically the same thing. I used roughen once um, to get sort of the bulbiness, the big moves of the tree. And then I used roughen again to get the small moves of the tree. And I, and I could have, I didn't. To, because I didn't think it needed as much detail, but I could have used tweak again as well to get that next level of detail uh, if I wanted to. And then of course I have uh, I have a grain in here, which is the vertical grain. And then what I did is I added a second layer. I darkened that layer, and I used transform and feather. That's the shadow right here. And we can see I didn't even care that it was falling onto the ground because it begins to come. To the ground. That that this whole thing, the shade on the tree and the shade on the ground, that is all that this fill, right? And it sort of becomes the shade of the tree and the shade of the ground simultaneously, uh, which is a nice trick. And, and to do that, it's just the exact same shape. I just use transform. So it's this tree. It just shifted over to the right and downwards to do that. And then of course I added uh, transparency to it so that it would fade into to the tree just like you would do for any shadow. Uh, and that was that tree. I have a trunk coming up. Don't worry about that. But then this tree is exactly the same thing. This ultimately, I copied this tree and shrunk it down. So then the settings for all the crinkles and roughen change accordingly. So there's some slight changes to all the dimensions there, but essentially it's the same thing. And then I just used the paintbrush and a green, and I just painted on these trees. No, nothing big there. Uh, this tree trunk was actually done in the foreground originally, but I had to move it behind other elements, so I ended up putting it here. So right now it just looks like this funnel. Don't worry about that. We'll just turn it on for now. Um, and then what I did, again, I did this as one of the last steps, uh, but just since it's here in the order, I add uh, layer order, I'll show it now. It's just a gradient here. It doesn't make sense without the foreground on, but I was just sort of fading the the foreground and background elements into the distance, giving it a sense of depth across the page. And it was just a simple gradient uh, that exists here. We'll, we'll see it as we sort of develop the foreground, which is the next step. Um, so I'm going to start, I think, maybe near the top here, because uh, some of the interesting things about this drawing is that the border turns into the tree. Um, and sort of breaks down the edges that way. So if I start there, this actually took a lot of layers, a little bit more cheating than I usually like to do, but it was fine for this image. It worked good. So if I unlock this, basically I did the same thing. Here's this polygonal shape, just like the trees in the background. It's got two roughens to give it that shape. I made a compound path to put a little hole in it like that. So it, so the hole, hole becomes comes a part of it. I used the same gray stroke that I used on the border way at the beginning of this video with the film grain on it. And that is basically that part of the tree. Uh, this trunk was done with only one roughen to give it a little bit of, uh, you know, shape. And I just, I basically drew out a branch in a straight line. And then I gave it a little bit of variation in through it. And I used the same stroke gray with film grain and so on and so forth. And the same thing exactly for this guy is done. Two roughens, the scales are different because it's a smaller tree. But other than that, it's the same. 
so I have that thing there. The, the issues with this is, well, we don't quite, it's harder to see, but we can see that this line's cutting across here. Um, but I wanted the line to come here and then come down and follow this edge. So what I did is I just did a uh, new layer and I just took the same tan color from my border and I just carefully drew at that edge to make it look like the line was coming through there. And I just covered up on a layer above that corner that I didn't want to see. Same here at the trunk where the trunk came down. Now I let I let this sort of uh, piece come down purposely. I could have covered up this piece of line, but it sort of sets the edge of that branch coming across the streets, uh, across the tree. So I sort of used it as part of the drawing. Same with the bottom, sort of give it a base. I purposely let it come out a little bit. Originally I had it all blocked up, but I was like, hey, let me give that a try, and I liked it. And the same here. Again, that box just covers up that line we can see right there. And then I added a, a few extra lines, so I just took took this thing, I just drew a basic line and then used the same roughen to get that shape. It's the exact same roughen that I used to get this shape, right? So it then continues on. And this is just the line sitting over the brown. So it gives it that like, oh, I just took my drawing out. I broke I broke the plane of the drawing. We can I, I've used this trick before where I you break you don't have a square edge of color. So in this case it's the trees are defining that and then then the, and the reverse of that is that some of the line work breaks the border in this case. Gives some interest there. Um, and then I totally cheated uh, also because I just used like a pencil tool and I just scribbled some lines in there, get some shade and shadow a little more densely in here to give that leaf a little shadow. And then same sort of texture of trees, just, just took a pencil quickly, like, okay, it can be squiggly and then sort of worked out just to add that little bit of detail there. So that's the the foreground trees. Um, let's see. Another, then, then the uh, thing I did probably in the foreground is I probably added the path. Gotta turn on the foreground master layer. Oh, I got some something in the foreground over top of it. It's perfectly fine. Or actually, maybe I used clipping mask. I think I used clipping mask on this object in the end. Uh, that's okay. We can see it's sort of this circuitous thing and I didn't add the path to my model this is something you see in Photoshop I show how to do a path really easily you don't have a path of model here do this 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 and this and you have a path that matches the perspective um, and I had to do the exact same thing here I literally screenshotted this image I could have saved it as a JPEG I like screenshot open in Photoshop ran this trick got my shape of my path you can find the video on how to do that. Then I screenshot that Photoshop, brought it into here as a layer, which no longer exists. I de I've deleted it since then. And then traced, roughly traced that shape so I could know it would match the perspective really easily. Because I tried drawing this shadow, other, I mean, sh sh shadow. I tried drawing this path otherwise right here in, in Illustrator. It just wasn't working. It's very hard to do a curvy path in perspective. Um, and I was like, this is taking too long. I can do this in three seconds in Photoshop and I'll just trace over it. So you can see I wasn't too concerned about these hard edges here because what I did is if I select it, let's see, the layer's still locked. If I select this, what I did is I just did round corners on it that smoothed out the, the edges. Um, and I added a small film grain to this to give it some texture. Um, so I turned off here. Let me turn that on. There we go. To give it some texture as in paving, I use the same sort of grain gray line on it. And in this case, the texture's not identical between the two lines, but you know what? It's good enough and it's my only, you can see I ended up having to clip out some of it in the end anyway, but a lot of this is also going to be covered up by the foreground landscaping that we'll see here in a second. Um, so it doesn't have to be perfect. In fact, drawings that aren't perfect often are nicer looking to look at. Not talking about construction documents, which of course need to be perfect, but this is a rendering. Um, so if I, if, if I jump above it, we can see I added a couple shapes here for this foreground grass, which again covers up a lot of the path itself as well. Um, and this has a lot going on to it. So there's actually a few layers here. Um, if I turn on, uh, let's see, that's on, if I turn on this grain, we see on this layer, this comes up and sort of creates this stroke. And then, and then I use darken to blend the two colors together and the result is a sort of greener color which starts to stand out. I talked about that earlier that these things would become a bit greener. Um, and then there's a stroke on here. And then the key to this again is just like a lot of the trees. Uh, there's roughen on here which sort of gives it almost like grass-like thing. And then I tweaked it 
to really sort of make it random just like that like all blowing all sort of crazily there and then the same is true on this guy the exact same thing actually I have two roughens here just at a different scale um, but otherwise it's the exact same settings or very very similar settings there um, and then I think there's I thought there was another one here maybe not maybe I guess that was it um, I was experimenting so and then the rest of the grass is exactly the same sort of steps I think if I turn these all on roughens and tweaks uh, colors a stroke a fill with a grain darkened over top of the other one to sort of turn it into that shape uh, and then same thing with that guy to give it sort of sort of there's a sort of foreground more squiggly background less squiggly look and then again way back in the background just setting it back rough in rough in um, now there is a slight difference to this one um, that I did where I um, did this inner glow effect it's just like the effect on this background one is exactly like I did for the the grass so I wanted it to sort of not be all stroked solid I wanted to sort of fade it out as we got into the background I wanted to sort of fade out the center um, and not make it as uh, textured as the sort of foreground stuff so it just uses this inner glow with uh, it's a bl it's a got a black uh, inner glow you screen it that fades away you're left with the color in between uh, and and there you go and there's a little one back here as well at this level same exact thing this one has basically just like the other grasses so there we go that's all turned on and um, I think that's it yeah I'm just shy of an hour that's pretty good obviously it took me longer than an hour to draw although I did do pretty much most all this work in less than a day um, but most of that day <laughs> uh, and I've been you know, I think maybe some tweaking of color and textures might still be in order, but but that's the drawing. There's the drawing. I recreate it. You can see again the point of this drawing was to uh, to show you long version, right? It's just to show the level of thinking of how to compose these different things together and how they might go together. I really think this drawing was pretty successful uh, and took takes longer to do than using Photoshop in a 3D modeler um, and so it's not right for all jobs that we are working on a budget but if you're trying to make a different kind of drawing we have a lot of control exporting lines from SketchUp and doing every single thing in Illustrator gives that to you now I did I had to say I did as I was sort of thinking about things I talked about the path here how I sort of quickly took it into Photoshop really quickly and uh, and did a little bit of outlining work so I could get it there there were other times especially with the foreground colors like I have things in Photoshop about making flowers and um, shadowing I was when I was thinking about the shadowing of this tree originally I was like should I just do it the way I would do it in Photoshop should I take it in a Photoshop for that step and bring it back in and um, and you could I, I didn't I wanted to just say I'm doing all in Illustrator other than outlining the uh, path but it's still the path the real geometry is still in Illustrator um, but it, but I think at times there might be like you know what I just need a layer from from Photoshop just to be placed in here it'll just be the easier thing to do um, I didn't use it in this case but I think that's perfectly reasonable uh, to do uh, and you get it you have a drawing that you know begins to be your own and look unique and uh, and I encourage people to experiment with this model when they have the time right and sort of take control from the computer so good luck I hope you sort of enjoyed that overview of drawing a complete drawing which I don't usually do I know a bit long and probably if you're still listening I can't imagine really what would make you listen to this whole video but you know there there you go thanks for watching